Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 170, The Green Economy. And the vlog this week comes from a spectacular location, Stewart Island, right at the base of Aotearoa, New Zealand, on the day, nay, night of the winter solstice. If there's a better space, if there's a better time to be recording this vlog on the green economy, I'm uncertain. But it is the time, it is the place for us all to think about the green economy. And it is interesting for PhD students and it's interesting for researchers in ways that perhaps you cannot imagine. Because I think it also provides a meta lesson of our failures. Our failures as scholars and our failures as researchers. Bit of a downer at the start, but let me explain why. For those of you that remember my vlog that I recorded just about a year ago in Manchester, sitting next door to the Alan Turing statue, that vlog was on the organic intellectual, and I provided definitions and explanations about why the organic intellectual matters to all of us as a concept and as a project. An organic intellectual is an expert. An expert that knows their field so incredibly well that they're able to transcend academic life, transcend academic conferences, and express these ideas to the world, to the citizens that actually pay for our research. They know that field so well that they're able to communicate it to a diversity of audiences. So the research can travel, can move, can morph, can transcend. So therefore, it becomes usable research. Therefore, the burden is on us as scholars to not only conduct the highest scholarly work that we can do, but to find innovative new strategies to disseminate that research for many different audiences. It has to be contextually resonant, but also timely of its time. Now, if we do this well, then the research, the information, the knowledge that we create is able to inform and inflect societal debate. Right, so there's the argument. Then, of course, we move to the environment, <laughs> uh, to climate change, whatever cliche you would like to use, and the failures of us as scholars to make this discussion work, to provide the framework to enact change. Think about the last 40 years of intellectual commentary on climate. When I was 10, 10, I won my first writing award. I'd entered an essay competition and my essay was on coal, showing the unsustainability of the use of coal in creating energy. I was 10. That is a very, 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 very long time ago. So much has gone wrong in how we as scholars have communicated, has framed, have defined, have enacted this debate about climate change. A lot's gone wrong. Now, I'm not blaming us as academics, well, not completely. This is a multi-phasic failure, social, economic and political, many groups, many communities. And look, we live in a time where minor issues, minor people suddenly become important and gain agency and become populist. Notice I didn't say popular, populist. But think about all the cliches that encircle climate change. And these cliches also come from academics. Think about our cliche, believe the science. Believe the science, right. That hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. And remember, I'm not anti-expertise, I believe in expertise. But the notion of believing the science has not worked. But do we, as academics, want our fellow citizens to simply believe us? Isn't that some sort of evangelical commitment? Like we believe in unicorns, we believe in magic, we believe in the power of the force, Luke. Now, I'm not a big supporter of believing, to be frank with you. I'm a big supporter of information literacy so that citizens can read, hear, interpret and think and make their own minds up. We're in the mess that we are right now on the planet for a singular reason. We tend to believe rather than read. 
we tend to believe rather than think. You see, I don't want people to believe the science. I want people to respect expertise, that's different. But I don't want people to believe the science. I want to improve science education, science communication, science literacy in schools, in universities and in our wider society so that we as scholars can create the information, create the knowledge, and that's crucial. But then we don't stop there. We create the next stage for the communication system to citizenry for our research. So we're actually creating information literacy, not an evangelical commitment via belief. So what I'm talking about here is science in context. Sometimes it's called the Science in Society project. And it will change the world if we do this properly. Just as law in context that became socio-legal studies changed our understandings of law beyond black letter law. Believing the science has not worked because it's a combination of the evangelical and the empiricist. And that is a well dodgy combination. So we need science communication, we need science literacy so that our citizenry can see how the climate science is relevant to them. Facts don't speak. People do. And that's why, for example, why, why Al Gore was so successful and also, of course, so attacked because he was successful. He read the science and then didn't stop there. He found strategies to communicate that science via Inconvenient Truth 1 and 2. Now, you may disagree with what he did, and there were bits of it that I think all of us should disagree with, but he presented an argument and further, he then scaffolded information literacy into climate science. So what we're going to do in the vlog this week is actually not what I'm talking about here. I'm not entering the debate about climate science. I'm saying that's a whole thing that we have to do. That's a project. It's not about believing or, or not believing. It's not about belief. Instead, I'm going to park this issue. I'm going to move the debate over a bit for something that's incredibly relevant, not only for PhD students, but also for researchers more generally. Our research community, I've got a friend, it was always going to happen, and our society. So what we're doing is the green economy, and this really matters. How we all, as scholars and citizens, through recycling, reuse and reduction of waste, and proto-obsolescent goods can create a new and effective way of creating production and consumption. We're also thinking about new ways of creating profit, how fantastic, and new ways of making a living. New ways of living, new ways of working, new ways of, I'm going to say the word, having a leisure life as well. So let's do this. The green economy is a risk mitigation strategy. It attempts to reduce the risks enacted through environmental change and manage the consequences of ecological scarcities. You'll hear the word scarcities a lot, it matters. The goal is, I'm going to use the phrase, sustainable development. Now you know I think that phrase is a bit dodgy, but what it means in this context is always thinking about economic and social development through the developments in and through nature. Okay, the term green economy was first used in the United Kingdom in a governmental report in 1989. And the report was titled Blueprint for the Green Economy. And it's from Pierce et al. And it's still available online as a PDF. So the researchers offered strategies to ensure that sustainable development was always considered in any policy for economic progress. So that was a major moment, an epistemological shift. So the term green economy has affiliations and relationships with ecological economics, but it has a slightly different meaning. It is more active, it's more applied, and frequently it's also more political. The green economy is about efficiency, but it's also about fairness managing competing interests. Remember we talked about the political economy a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, well, this is the party. This is where we apply it. And the United Nations environmental program in particular focuses on the combination of the value of, if you will, low carbon environments, waste reduction, 
and also social inclusivity. It sees the, sees the three variables in alignment. The green economy is based on a singular fundamental truth that nature has economic value and that the ecological services developed by the natural environment also have economic value. Now, I've always been a believer as a manager, as a leader, in full economic costing. And I think all of us as managers don't really think completely about full economic costing. We have certain variables and that'll do. Now, I think that's wrong. The green economy really takes full economic costing seriously. So, what is carbon capture worth? What is coastal regeneration worth? What is the value of the reduction in the number of cars and the increasing efficiency of public transportation? What's the economic value of that to an individual, to a family, to a workplace, and also to leisure industries, if you're not spending your life in a car doing a commute? So there are lots of approaches to the green economy. Some of them are feminist or pacifist. <laughs> Yeah, or anarchist, clearly an anarchist, but we've also got a diversity of these approaches that are highly political, and I'm not going there today, but they are available for your consideration. My argument in the vlog this week is a bit simpler than that, that natural capital should be considered as part of labour capital and physical capital. It has value economic value. So Carl Burkhardt argued that the green economy has six sectors or areas. Renewable energy, green buildings, fascinating literature around green buildings, sustainable transport, we've then got water management, we have waste management, and of course land management. All these sectors require metrics, accounting strategies and also reporting strategies and they are really the foundation for new economic strategies, new workforces and new ways of working. We need all sorts of new measurement strategies and they are emerging for us. The Global Green Economy Index is a ripper. Green City Index, which I use all the time in my city imaging work, that's now quite a mature index. Circles of sustainability is less used, but of course the ecological footprint is the measurable strategy that's entering popular culture. So what I'm particularly interested in is how public and private investment in the green economy is going to change the project of our universities and also change the nature of our workforce. For me, this is the key differential, the way we think about the green economy and sustainable development. Sustainable development's a bit generalised for me. The green economy is measurable. The green economy focuses on investment, infrastructure, capital, employment, but also skill development. So those of us in schools and universities, we have skin in this game. It is also a mainstream policy with economic interests, new business models, new financial protocols, and is also capacity building through education and through training. It's also a risk mitigation, risk management system to manage change in our institutions. It enables us to think about the local, the regional, the national and international in clear ways, ensuring that local development explores sustainable development in all economic policies. So the green economy is about public and private partnerships, and that's a great thing, changing our consumption and our production patterns, which I would also argue is a good thing, and offering new ways to think about efficiency. There are lots of critiques of the green economy, lots and lots, but the main one is a critique of the pricing mechanism that's being used to protect nature, meaning that businesses will start to gain areas of influence in new topics and industries, but also new spheres like forests and like water systems. So the argument is that the green economy, and this is an important one, will focus our corporations on the control of our natural resources. So basically Mad Max, if you will, becomes a documentary of contemporary life. 
But this issue will require a whole of society solution. As Olivia Binner argued in a fascinating article in 2013, economic and financial crises historically reveal profound and complex relationships with environmental crises, not causal, much more complex than that. So the goal of the green economy is to enable and align cycles of progress and prosperity. So what is significant here? Well, there is a reason I am recording this vlog in Aotearoa, New Zealand, in the magnificent Stewart Island. And that is because New Zealand, Aotearoa, New Zealand, is ahead of the curve in terms of policy. So really what New Zealand policy is questioning this year, right now, today, 2019, is, is growth, is economic growth the imperative of policy? Should it be? the imperative of policy. And if we're going to rethink that premise, it's going to change policy, it's going to change universities, it's going to change the workplace. Because I think all of us have become so invested through our lives about valuing and validating economic growth as an unchanging, unchallengeable variable. So, you know, in the last quarter, we had this level of economic growth. We've got used to that reporting cycle. Without exploring the full context and the risks that enable that economic growth, yeah? So we need really more expansive definitions of the green economy. And it requires a redefinition of what is prosperity. And therefore we have to take on this notion of economic growth and consider new ways of growth that may involve learning, education, health, and I'm gonna use the word even though it worries me, well-being. Put a more negative way, our policy makers have some heavy lifting to do at the moment. The world is now managing scarcity. Scarcity of water, food, energy, and yes, security. And of course, Regenerative Adelaide, that wonderful series of policies enabled by two of our former premiers in South Australia, tried to transform South Australia as a city region to, in a way that would sort of link up our policies of resources and resource development and the ecological footprint to start to tether or link those policies. That was a good strategy. So green economics is many things and at its most useful I think for those of us who are researchers in the present but also in the future is that it is a methodology. It is a methodology intertwining with care, reflection and sustainability how human behaviour operates and nests in the natural world. It intervenes in economic decisions, arguing that all policies, all strategies must be viewed through the lens, through the ecosystem. It also recognises that natural capital is of economic value. Now, a few of the industries in our future will require multidisciplinary teams and interdisciplinary teams to increase our resourcing, increase our efficiency in our energy use, use, but also envisioning, if you will, a whole new series of business sectors, a whole new series of models for rebooting our older industries, but also developing new ones. And also, I think, particularly recognising the economic value of food, food tourism and leisure. So the development of technologies is also going to be important that reduces our energy consumption, recovers the valuable byproducts and also minimises waste. Now this doesn't seem a terribly controversial area to me, this seems rational, logical and something where there's good arguments that we can sustain those arguments. And indeed, when I grew up, there was a cliche where there's muck, there's money. And I still believe it to this day. When there is a problem, a job will emerge to solve it. So whatever comments may be made about the science of climate change, there is strong work, really strong research work to be conducted to think about reuse recycling and also reducing our waste. But also where I'm interested in is enhancing 
the efficiency of our services so that our transportation systems and our working lives are also more efficient. And look, let's get there. Really what we're doing is we're rethinking the meaning and the purpose of our lives. Is economic growth the answer no matter what question we ask? Now, these questions, these big questions, are in the scope of the green economy, and they require engineers, chemists, physicists, biologists, but also philosophers, urban planners, economists, obviously, and sociologists, just to name a few of our disciplines. So this is time, it is time, to think about the green economy. Not for morality, not for moral reasons at all, but for creating new ways of thinking about development, about growth, and about living. It's up to us, us, to create this strong research, but it's also up to us to find strategies to communicate it effectively and well to a series of groups in our culture that can gain from these transformations and will also lose from the scarcities in our culture. So, Hasn't has been quite mythic. From the truly beautiful Stuart Island on this winter solstice, respect to the Druids, I wish you love, light and peace. Wow. Tea out. Well, that was epic. You're going to struggle to beat that. No pressure. How pretty is that? <laughs>